We'll get started. Please continue enjoying your lunch. Thank you, everyone. And um, in case I forgot to say it, I don't have $18 million. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to begin this interview, don't you think? I'm impressed. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, Ted Sorensen. It's really it's an honor to have you here. I don't, I don't throw that word around lightly, but uh, Thank it, you. it means a lot to me. Um, I enjoyed your book so much, and as I said before, I, I really enjoyed the audio book. And what the audio book allowed me to do, in some ways, was um, retrace the, a lot of the pathways of, of, I know you don't like to call it Camelot, but the Kennedy no. era. And um, so I could walk around to the places you're talking about and listen to it at the same time. And yesterday, even though you don't really write about it in the book, it just, I just felt driven to um, go to the Kennedy gravesite, which I did. And when I was there, I wondered, do you, do you visit the gravesite? Uh, no, not because I don't think of it with the greatest respect, but it is also as a reminder of the saddest day of my life. So it's too sad for you to go there. Have you been to the grave site? I have been there. I have taken visitors there once mm -hmm. or twice. But a long time ago, not? A long time ago. And it's, um, you, you make this very clear in the book that you, in many ways, are no less sad now than you were when he died. It's a, it's a sadness that won't leave you. That's true. Life goes on. I've had an interesting and challenging and very fortunate life since JFK's uh, death and uh, all these uh, years uh, since mm -hmm. I left the White House. But the, the, that particular chapter was, for me, the toughest chapter in the book to write. The, the chapter about, his act, about learning about his assassination. Yes. It, it was interesting, too, because you make a point of saying that you, you happened to be at the White House. You, you saw him the day before when he left oh, for yes. Dallas. And oh, in yes. fact, the last time you saw him, you handed him some notes. It was just That's right. the most inconsequential of That's right. It was, I, I can still see it in my mind's eye. He was about to get in his helicopter on the uh, back White House lawn, which would take him to Andrews Air Force Base, where he would board Air Force One for Texas. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then you went about your business. Yes. Uh, and the next day, you had been, what, were you, at, were you at the Pentagon? You were out of the White House, and your driver told you to call the White House or return to the White House. No, no, actually, I was in the White House car on my way back to the White House. Okay. Cause and I really don't like talking about this, Carol, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, the uh, dispatcher's voice came over the radio. I could hear it. Mm -hmm. Do you have Mr. S they didn't say Mr. Sorensen. I had a you secret had a service. What was, your, what was your secret service name? I am happy to say I've forgotten it. <laughs> I guess you didn't like it very much. Uh, no, no, I just have no recollection of what it was. But uh, they, they, oh, thanks. <laughs> They, uh, the dispatcher said, is Mr. Sorensen uh, in the car? And the driver said, yes. And the dispatcher said, please return to the White House immediately. And I couldn't you, imagine uh, what could be the reason for it. Because, because what had happened was unimaginable. I'll say. And the interesting thing to me and, um, was, and you, and you remark about this, is that when the death was confirmed, there was no chaos, there was no, there was no drama. Everybody was just... I wouldn't say there was no drama. Well, but, drama's probably... But there, but there was no, no chaos. chaos, there was, was no shrieking. Because the, 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 and the means of information were so limited back then, you went to a Secret Service office where they had a direct line to Parkland. Exactly. But there, it, it, it wasn't like it would be um, today. And you, you were supposed to go to your brother's for dinner, but then you were asked to come to Andrews to Yes. To you meet. read the book well. I, well, it's, it's <laughs> twice. Um, but... That was the first time you cried. 
Oh, please. Uh, no, what I relate in the book is that my brother, uh, who was the deputy director of USIA, uh, insisted that I come out to have... To his house for dinner. Dinner with him and his family, and I did not want to be alone, and I went out there, and then, oh boy, and the, uh, we had, uh, dinner had just started when the, the phone rang, and it was Lyndon Johnson on the phone, and, uh, this is tough. I uh, I really don't talk about this. I, it uh, he uh, was very nice, and he urged me to stay. He said how much he needed me, how much he understood how I felt, and that he wanted me to come to his see him in his office, if possible, the next day. And that is in his office, which mm -hmm. was the vice president's office. Uh, he was still calling from there. Oh, God. I, and so I uh, agreed that I would try to do that, and he thanked me, and I said, thank you, Mr. President. And I broke down. And after all these years, I'm sorry, but I still don't like to think about that, even that one second. That, 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 well, I, I understand. Um, May I read your, some of your own words back to you from your book? Yes, but please pick some other chapter. Uh, well, this, no, this I, I, well I, hope, I hope this doesn't make you sad. I thought this was, um, you know, I, I, just, I thought it was poetic. I, it, it, had a, it had music to it when I read it, and especially hearing you read it. But um, I remember John F. Kennedy clearly. I remember him clearly despite the idolaters who have almost buried the memory of the real man under a Camelot myth too heroic to be human, despite the exaggerated attention and speculation, some malicious, some merely mindless, focused on allegations about his private life, and despite the revisionist detractors whose, hi who highlight, who, whose hindsight distortions of his life and record have not lessened his hold on America's affectionate memory. Too little of what he said privately was written down. All too little was written with his own hand or recorded in his own voice. Hindsight, grief, and wishful thinking, no doubt, make somewhat selective the recall of even those of us who knew him well. But what I do remember, I remember clearly, not as a professional historian or as a detached observer, but as a friend who misses him still. And that really is the book. That's what the book's all That's about. That's what the book's all about. Or at and least part two of the book, the middle part of the book. first part of the book is about my own uh, Yes, your own up, journey. Uh, Coming here from Nebraska, yes. a, a Midwestern Danish Jew, Unitarian, <laughs> right? Yes. All those things. And as you point out over and over, abstemious. Which, which, meant you're, which meant you were coming to a city where you would be almost unique. That's why I just ordered lemonade. <laughs> lemonade, well, well, and this is the time of year. But when you come back to Washington, as you have today, do did the, did these mem did the memories of your arrival here flood you still? Oh, my arrival is... It was uh, so humble. <laughs> well, it was very clear in my mind. Uh, I took a taxi from uh, Union Station. It was the first taxi I'd ever been in in my entire life. And in those days, Pennsylvania Avenue was open, and the, I was going to the yes. YMCA. I don't know if it's still where it used it, to well, be. Well, it still exists. I don't know if it's the same. And location. I was staying, uh, I had heard you could get cheap rooms at the YMCA. And or I were they was, $8 a night or something? I, have not, I don't remember <laughs> that, but that sounds about right. But so the taxi went right by the White House on Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Avenue. And the uh, front uh, chandelier light or whatever was on, and I just gazed at that with awe and wonder. Yeah. Do you still? Of course. And I, despite its occupant, I look at it with respect. <laughs> Uh, but you didn't go right to the White House to work. You actually no, went. Not. You went to Capitol Hill. You got a job. No, no. My first job uh, was working for what is now the Department of Health and Human Services. Right, right. I was in the office of General Counsel, mm -hmm. and that led because to you were a, a lawyer. You yeah, had I was your a law lawyer. Degree. Yes, that led to a Capitol Hill job. Uh, 
which was temporary, and that led to the office of, in, uh, of the man who in fall of 52 was newly elected uh, to the United young, States Senate. A young senator. But, but he was one of two senators who offered you jobs. That's true. And you chose him over? Over Scoop Jackson. Why? It's uh, probably a longer story than you want me uh, to tell, but, uh oh, that's probably my fault. Is that yours? That's <laughs> uh, not Mrs. Giuliani, I'm sure of that. <laughs> Well, so, uh, we'll ignore it. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Paul Douglas of Illinois, one of the great United States senators, uh, was uh, the chairman of this temporary committee I was working for. Do you want to hand it to me and I'll give it to Paul? Yeah. And then Paul can look out for it for you. Yeah. I'm going to do this. Here, now, give, now hand it to me. Now give it. And I'll give it to Paul. Okay, there. thank you. And then will we pass this down to now. Go on with your story. So, choosing uh, Jack Kennedy yes, so, over uh, Scoop Jackson. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so Paul Douglas said, I couldn't go back into the executive branch mm -hmm. because Eisenhower had just been elected president, the first Republican in 20 years, and he asked for a freeze on executive branch employment. So Senator Douglas said uh, he would recommend me to some of the new incoming senators, mm -hmm. because at least three of them were members of the House, Democratic members of the House with whom we had worked, Mike Mansfield, Scoop Jackson, and Jack Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And letters were written by uh, Senator Douglas or his administrative assistant, Bob Wallace, to uh, all three. I'm not sure they ever heard back from Mansfield. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other two both said they were interested and both interviewed me, both offered me jobs. My mentors in, uh, in uh, Washington at that time, one was Senator Douglas's uh, administrative or legislative assistant, Bob Wallace. The other was a lawyer here named, uh, who later became a distinguished lawyer in New York, uh, Stanley Gewertz. Both of them said to me, oh, take uh, Jackson. He's, yeah, because he's the tried and true. He's tried and true, yeah. progressive from the progressive Northwest, got a great future. Jack Kennedy's uh, dilettante. He's too close to his right-wing father. Mm -hmm. His right-wing father never hired anybody except an Irish Catholic, so on and on. But because I had been more favorably impressed in those brief interviews by Kennedy, I decided couldn't make up my mind. I decided I would re-interview both of them and ask what it is they wanted me to do. And Jack Kennedy said he wanted me to uh, produce a legislative program for the economic revitalization of New England, which is a pretty tall order for a, uh, <laughs> but, but you like a young that. lawyer from Nebraska. And uh, Scoop Jackson said, oh, Paul Douglas said you're the brightest lawyer he ever met. I need someone like that to get my name in the papers. <laughs> wasn't wasn't too tough to figure out which of those two I wanted to work you, for. You you talk about coming into this uh, Irish Catholic uh, mafia, so to speak, and you tell a, a wonderful anecdote about going to a campaign appearance with uh, Kennedy once, uh, and and he told you to say you were from West Hyannis, <laughs> <laughs> which may not have even existed, but that's true. He felt the need to pass you off as something other than what you were. <laughs> He certainly didn't want to introduce his legislative system as being from Nebraska. <laughs> um, McGeorge Bundy uh, said that you were that you were an extra Kennedy brother. That you were like that you loved it. You know that you were like an, an, another brother. And um, at what point in your relationship, if it ever did feel that way to you, what 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 what? What moment in your relationship did you t to find bonding? I mean, was there, a, was there a singular moment where you realized how well you connected? It must have been the fall of 1956. I started work for him in January 1953, and gradually my duties enlarged and one thing after another. At the uh, summer of 56, at the Democratic National Convention, he became an overnight a national figure, 
A, he uh, was the narrator of a film on the Democratic Party. B, he gave the speech nominating Stevenson for a mm -hmm. second try at the presidency. And C, uh, there was a, a wide open contest for the vice presidency, which had never happened before or since. And it ended up very exciting. A lot of distinguished people were in that race, including Al Gore Sr., Hubert Humphrey, Estes Kefauver, Kennedy. And it became a seesaw exciting finish between Kennedy and Kefauver. And finally, he went to the rostrum and um, said, in the interest of party unity, or <clears throat> I don't remember the exact words, I move that uh, Estes Kefauver be nominated by acclamation. Mm -hmm. No one had ever seen a uh, politician, politician step back, step like, step back that. like that, and mm -hmm. he was uh, so t wonderfully telegenic that he became an overnight hero. He left on a European vacation, just as happy that he wasn't going to be the mm -hmm. running mate on a losing ticket. <laughs> and when he came back, I went over to his home. Uh, uh, which wasn't that far from mine. It later became known as Bobby's Home, Hickory, Hickory Hill. Hill. And I put on his dining room table uh, in stacks all these invitations that had poured in to, to the office. I tried to arrange them according to priority and calendar and geography, working out sort of a rough uh, schedule for the fall. And he looked at me and said, you might as well come with me. And for the next three, four years, just the two of us traveled together Everywhere. to all 50 states, some of them he more than He didn't make once. an appearance without you in the mix, basically. Well, I was certain, I don't know about the mix, but I was certainly close behind. Uh, I, I, I and could, I uh, it was during that time that we bonded. I can think of only one instance in the book where you were actually asked to leave the room once, and that was by Bobby Kennedy. And that <laughs> may have been true. more of a power play than authentically necessary, right? Well, that was after uh, Bobby had uh, joined the team mm -hmm. and was, in effect, becoming the campaign manager. Mm -hmm. I was too young, inexperienced. Were you a threat to Bobby? Was I? A threat to Bobby. Well, uh, that's all described. More of a brother some, than a brother. Uh, that's uh, that's described in some detail in the book. Bobby and I did not uh, start out on the best of terms. When I was an assistant to Jack Kennedy, he was an assistant to Joe McCarthy, mm -hmm. and which ran counter to virtually everything you believed in. That's true, and we looked at each other with a certain amount of suspicion, because I was neither Harvard uh, mm -hmm. nor Irish Catholic. Right. You were Nebraska, Danish, Jewish Unitarian, <laughs> right. and abstemious. And I don't know whether you played touch football. Well, you, you, you did play touch football once with Bobby, and he decked you, right? <laughs> You've got all the bad stories. <laughs> I, I, I remember exactly. It was the Saturday Evening Post, uh, which wanted to have some pictures for an article they were doing on the young senator from Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And so they, we, uh, that is, Jack, Bobby, and I agreed to have a pretend touch a football game. A photo op, we now call a it. A photo op, yes, <laughs> on the lawn right across from the Senate office building. Mm -hmm. The old, the original Senate office building. I think it may be called the Russell building now. And so we went I out onto so. that lawn, and the idea was, uh, uh, Jack would uh, throw me a pass, Bobby would defend. I went up for the pass, and as I did, I was tackled, which is not usually the way I uh, touch football. I think I there may have been more in that than I just... Went, uh, I went down on the grass in my one good Senate suit. <laughs> um, that gave me some sense of how he felt, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, when did you first meet Jackie? Oh, uh, Jack, the courtship between uh, Jack and Jackie must have begun uh, in uh, the summer of 53. I don't remember the exact date. And but she came, she came to the office with him once and 
And, 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 and did other women come to the office to see him too? I mean, were you used no. to uh, a lot of girlfriends no. in his life? No. No? That doesn't mean there weren't, you just weren't meeting them. Or did Jackie, or did you know Jackie was the one by the fact that she came to the office? I knew she was the one by the fact they became engaged. Okay, well, that's the <laughs> Uh, did did their did their um, relationship surprise you, or did she seem to you to be the match for him? I mean, did you get it the way people have always seemed to get it that they seem like such a pair? Oh, I uh, for uh, what fifty years I uh, thought Jackie was the most wonderful woman in the world. And, I miss her still, and still think she was wonderful. You, um, I would. My impression would be that your relationship with her became closer and better after his death. That's true. That in the White House she was around and friendly, but distant. Yes, she was. Uh, yes, distant is, is exactly right. Uh, she was the president's uh, wife. She stayed in the East Wing. She attended to her little children. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, although we certainly had uh, mutual uh, respect and affection, uh, was not uh, that close mm -hmm. until after Jack was gone. Um, and you make a point uh, of saying that you, uh, you really weren't part of what the Georgetown scene of the Kennedy era. You, 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 didn't, you didn't socialize with uh, with the, the set, the Kennedy set, that much. That's true. Um, and, and you didn't mind I wasn't that. there to be his uh, drinking companion. Right. I didn't drink. You didn't I drink. I was there to be his uh, policy and speech advisor. But you had no desire to be no. in, that, in that world. You saw it happening around you, though. And mm. I gather mm. there were times that, I mean, you talk about going to Joe Alsop's. You talk about going to Mrs. Graham's. You tell a wonderful story about a woman named Mahoney. Was it Frances ah, Mahoney? Florence, Florence Mahoney. Florence Mahoney. And she uh, lived to be 103 and was one of the great ladies of Washington <laughs> and uh, died not that many years ago. She did something that, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis that could not happen today. She sent you, it could. She sent you dinner. She sent you dinner at the White House. That's and you actually true. received it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the Secret Service tested it on the way in. I, I doubt that. I just I thought that I, I I almost have a vision of her having it delivered right to the gate and it being uh, and it being taken up to uh, your desk. Um, Jackie, um, when you were writing your book Kennedy, when you wrote your first book on Kennedy, she sent you uh, marvelous notes um, that I thought were very interesting. Her 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 particular changes she wanted you to make. They weren't heavy-handed, but they were very precise. She had very precise feelings about certain things. Do you want to talk about that? I was living at Hyannisport, where Jackie had her home still at that time, when I finished my manuscript on my first big book, Kennedy, and I asked her if she would like to read it, not because I was submitting it to censorship right. but because there were some things that she knew more than I did uh, and she made many many corrections and suggestions none of which involved policy or uh, substance in any way but all of which were quite important for accuracy such as uh, I know I may I had one statement about uh, uh, Jack uh, being uh, not that big a drinker, but occasionally having a vodka in the afternoon, she wrote in the margin, never. <laughs> and one thing she was very insistent upon was when I referred to, to the little boy as, as John John, yeah, and she said, please do not use that name. He hates it. He's kidded about it. It's a babyish name, and Jack and I never used it. I'm not so sure that was... Uh, yeah, You're not true, so sure that's but, true, but... Uh, nevertheless, I uh, changed it. <laughs> in her, but in her... much more important for historians today are what she asked me to add or change regarding how I, or Jack, uh, 
felt about LBJ. And I was taken aback by her lack of a f respect for him. By her lack of respect for LBJ. Yes. But LBJ was good to her, wasn't he? I'm asking. From your mouth to uh, LBJ's ear. <laughs> <laughs> he was not good to her. Well, of course he was good to her if you... He needed her. If you think uh, honeyed uh, uh, phone conversations are the sum total of being good, he let her stay a few extra days uh, in the White House. He at all times expressed uh, solicitation and uh, concern, but um, when you've seen your husband's brains blown to bits in your own lap, uh, you need more than that. What, what could he have done differently? I mean, in terms that he couldn't have really let her stay at the White House. No, I that. don't know what he could have done differently. I'm not uh, complaining. I didn't complain You, you made book. your own peace with LBJ. So to speak. So to speak. I mean, you didn't stay with him, but... I stayed three months. You stayed... I stayed in long enough to make certain that the Kennedy legislative program, including civil rights, went forward, and it did, and I felt I had to... But it was very painful for you. I mean, not just emotionally, but you could feel the tide turning to this new administration, and you didn't no. want to be there. No, I, w I don't think that's the way I put it. I, f I simply felt that uh, even though I had the same title, the same office, mm -hmm. the same pay, pretty paltry in those days, and uh, the uh, pretty much uh, same access to the president, not quite, but I knew it was my job was different because mm -hmm. my job had uh, been the outcome uh, or the evolution of 11 years with uh, JFK and the bond uh, between us, which meant I was involved in almost everything and uh, did not have to uh, have anything I wrote or decided or cleared uh, by anyone other than uh, JFK. And once uh, President Johnson took over, he brought in his own people like Bill Moyers and George Reedy, and Walter Jenkins, and they entitled they were entitled to have yeah. the kind of relationship that I had once had, and, and including all the perquisites that went with that. So I felt it was really more a matter of fairness uh, to them and to the new president if I left because JFK and I had spoken more than once about writing a book mm -hmm. about his presidency, and I felt I ought to uh, get on with write that. that book. Write that book, and that, and that was that. It was an honest and also good excuse. It was a great way to get out of town. You were talking uh, about something else when you said this. You were talking about when Carter um, uh, had nominated you for CIA director, which did not go the way you wanted it to. But you said you said when it's over in Washington, it's over. That's for sure. <laughs> when you're out, you're out. And you might as well leave town, right? <laughs> I didn't want to be a lobbyist. No. No. Well. Um, With all respect to the lobbyists who are here. Yes. <laughs> there are a few. Um, and then another thing Jackie uh, uh, was, was, com was commenting to you about was Caroline. She wanted you to ease up on Caroline. Um, in your in your memoir, Kennedy. Oh, there was a. So you, uh, the, I've already forgotten what it was. Something about Caroline and the press. Yeah, that she was said no photographs or something like that. And, no photographers. Uh, or, yes, and Jackie said, "Don't blame her." Uh, she learned she that learned from that, her parents. That, she, yeah, exactly. But she went on to say, "Caroline is far more sensitive and fragile than people realize," and. Has, is that the Caroline you know? Is she, is she sensitive and fragile? The Caroline I know right now is out campaigning for Obama, and yeah. she's a member of his vice presidential vetting committee, yeah. the only one who has survived. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what did you think of that? What did you and, think of, what, given modern politics, what did you think of what happened to Jim Johnson? 
I didn't see any justification of, for it whatsoever. But uh, it's, it's... But that's Washington. That's Washington. And, and now it's just Caroline. Do you think she could do it by herself, that the pre vice president? She's a very savvy young lady. I was frankly surprised that she took as much interest in Obama in particular and, and politics in general this year as she did. But uh, she has clearly enjoyed it and thrived on it. Well, looking at her um, gene pool, uh, do you feel that perhaps she could be about to step into a political role for herself? I don't, just think, I don't think so. She has some wonderful children and she devotes herself to them. They're growing up. And she also has been a successful writer. She's had several right? books. You can always write. <laughs> I mean, could you see easy her? Easy for you to say. Well, <laughs> well, actually, easy for you to say too. Um, could you see her as a political candidate, though? Could you see no. her running for office? No. Because you don't see it in her temperament, or do you don't think she's capable? She's capable of anything she wants to do, but I think uh, she has uh, more important priorities. Where do you see the Kennedy legacy residing then in the younger generation? Where do you see, if not her, who? Well, let's first of all see what happens to Senator Ted. He, I've seen him come back at least twice. I was by his bedside when he had an airplane crash in Massachusetts. Yes. The bone broke his back. I was by his bedside when he had a terrible automobile accident in Massachusetts. He came Chuck back Quiddick. from both of those. And I'm hoping and praying he'll come back from his Have you talked illness. to him since his uh, brain surgery? No, I wrote him a note, but I did not want to intrude into that. Uh, Have you heard from the family? No, I don't expect to. Um, well, it's a very family matter, and let's, uh, let's wait and see what um, happens. They, um, there's talk that uh, the Democratic Convention at some point, will, some part, will be about Teddy, and there's a hope that he might be able to speak. I hope so. Would you be writing the speech for him? No, I don't write speeches anymore for other people. I know you don't, people, but if he asks except you. Except for myself, and but, I can't but read you, those. But, but, you, but, you, but, you, but you've written speeches for Teddy in the past. I'm not sure I have. Well, you wrote, okay, it wasn't a speech, but you wrote his address on Chappaquiddick. You helped him write it. That's true. So there is. So it's not like the relationship isn't there of you helping him craft words. Oh that well, you would Ted speak. and I have a very good relationship. Uh, that I well, met what him, would you? I met him uh, fifth over. Well, just about fifty-five years. But he years was ago. a little squirt, practically. Well, he was the a, youngest brother. He wasn't little. He was playing football for Harvard. <laughs> um, but if, but let's put it another way then. What if you if you were writing? or advising on the speech for him to give at the Democratic Convention, what, what would you think the theme should be? From Teddy Kennedy, uh, potentially, potentially a last speech that he might be giving. To the yes, speech. I think that's a very uh, delicate advice that should be delivered confidentially, and I don't think this is the time and place. I will respect that. So then, you have, on the other hand, written what you think should be the Democratic nominee's speech for the convention. You have proposed a speech, haven't you? I have because... Uh, That's not confidential. No, no, of course not. The Washington Monthly, mm -hmm. a year ago, asked me to draft the... First they wanted me to do the inaugural, and that was a little too far off. And <laughs> I said, uh, so we compromised that I would draft the okay. speech that... Uh, would for me be ideal if the Democratic nominee, whoever it was mm -hmm. at that time, it was very unclear. In fact, at that time I had not selected a favorite candidate right. because I knew most of the contenders. So I did draft for the Washington Monthly and I'm glad to hear you uh, publicize it because I don't know how many people outside of Washington uh, Well, it's fascinating and, and, and when I read it, I wondered how would you recraft it um, for Obama. Would you change anything now that you know who the nominee I'm sure he be? would change a few uh, <laughs> items or a few controversial items in there and clearly he has to make his own decisions about what he's going to say in that uh, particular uh, speech at that particular time. When you heard the news about Teddy, um, what were the emotions that and the memories that went through you? 
I had just seen Teddy about a week earlier in New York where he had a meeting. I hope I'm not disclosing uh, uh, secrets here that he is preparing to announce uh, or his staff are preparing to announce later, but he, Teddy uh, wants to uh, help create a center for the study of the United States Senate. And I was Good attending idea. a meeting uh, on uh, that uh, project and I took that opportunity to present him with a copy of my book inscribed to him. And several days later, just before he received the news that sent him to the hospital, mm -hmm. I received a letter from him thanking me for the uh, book and the inscription and ironically expressing an optimistic note about the election this fall being sufficiently uh, pro-democratic. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, uh, it's a little uh, self-serving here, but the, the phrase he used was, so that your, he said to me, mm -hmm. so that your ideals can finally be implemented. Um, but this project will still happen. I hope so. Studying the Senate. And you, named for him. You say... But uh, as I say, I don't give up on him. I, <coughs> I think he may be contributing uh, to this country for many years to come. You, you, you think of him as so quintessentially a man of the Senate, don't you? Very much so. You said that you could imagine him dying there. Simply because uh, that has been his choice. His happiest place. Uh, he uh, could have taken his ease on the beach. Uh, he has the money. He has. He already has the fame and mm -hmm. all of that. But instead, he has chosen since 1962 to serve in the United States Senate, to work long hours, to take a certain amount of abuse, mm -hmm. to uh, forego the uh, luxuries and perquisites that come with the uh, private life, and I think uh, he will uh, as long as he lives. Do you see Jack in him at all? Of course, uh, he's got uh, Jack's uh, smile and mm -hmm. sense of humor and his uh, eloquence. In many ways, he is more at ease in the Senate itself than, than either is. Jack or Bobby. Uh, and uh, Teddy uh, is, a, is a good senator. He knows how to... Uh, make agreements uh, with the people on the other side of the aisle and he knows how to take a certain number of uh, slings and arrows and uh, he's a natural and I think he goes down in history uh, when he leaves as one of the great senators in history. Do you see um, the president in Caroline? I see uh, his face in Caroline all the time. She's very thoughtful She's a little bit shy. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that uh, JFK was a little bit shy, particularly when he started out. The, 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 the one that, you know, is as, as, as horrible and as unbelievable as the death of JFK was, I still think for a lot of people the death of John Jr. is as hard or harder to take. Was it that way for you? Well, I can't say it was harder. Uh, JFK had been my life for 11 years. But you must have seen uh, the father uh, John, and the son. Uh, John Jr., uh, uh, I mean, the, tr the terrible tragedy of his death is that so much was cut off so soon. Mm -hmm. I also felt that way about Jack's death because uh, he was still in the full bloom of his uh, abilities and ambitions and hopes, what he wanted to accomplish for this country and world as president. And uh, there it was uh, suddenly uh, gone and that affected my own future. Uh, and uh, I think a young John uh, might very well have gone into politics, much more likely than Caroline going into politics, but that was not to be. Did you have um, a relationship with him uh, that was close, with John Jr.? Not close, uh, quite different generations. Uh, we saw each other on occasions. 
I remember that uh, during the, um, what was it, what, it was probably the 50th anniversary of the United Nations, mm -hmm. and uh, Castro came to New York for it, and uh, I had met Castro earlier, and John called me up and asked if I would arrange uh, for him to interview mm -hmm. uh, Castro. Right. Your buddy Castro. Uh, no, not my buddy. Well, you had some things in common. I wouldn't say we had A much in common. A point in history. But, well, that's true. Uh, anyway, I did ask uh, Castro, and his answer was, why not? Mm -hmm. And were you in the room for that? No. Um, uh, he's directed me to one of his mm -hmm. traveling aides uh, who's suggested that both John and I come to a reception that was going to be held at the Cuban mission mm -hmm. later that week. And John, um, first of all, he was pleased and delighted that I had arranged for the interview, but he felt that it would be uh, misunderstood and out of control uh, publicity and pictures if he went to the reception. So instead, uh, I think he followed up. He had his up. mother's head about that, didn't he? About uh, yes. How things uh, would look. Yes, uh, but at some later point, and I don't know how much later, um, there it, the interview was arranged mm -hmm. in Cuba. Do you subscribe to the theory that there's a Kennedy curse? I certainly do not. I think the uh, had Kennedys enormous... have had, uh, yes, a curse, bad luck, a family that has given so much to this country that has served, uh, had so many people serve in, uh, in high position, who've been blessed with good looks and good brains and good uh, personalities. That's not a curse. It's true that because there are so many of them and because they are on the go and because they dare and they risk as restless, ambitious people do, there's bound to be some tragedies and uh, setbacks, but no, it's not a curse. The family that Joe and Rose raised, do, do they stand out remarkably um, in a way that families aren't being raised today? Well, let's, uh, let's stop for a moment and pay tribute to Jackie imagine trying to raise in that uh, glass house with yeah, everybody fishbowl. in the world mm -hmm. fishbowl looking at her and her children at a time when most teenage children were turning to drugs or communes or rebellions against authority she raised two wonderful wonderful uh, children. children and I think that was her. And not as monks and nuns either. They were uh, they were out there in the world uh, yeah. in a contemporary so, way. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start there and then going back I would say uh, both the Joe Kennedy and Rose Kennedy uh, did a marvelous job. Uh, Joe Kennedy interested his children and particularly his sons in public service mm -hmm. including politics and government uh, governmental affairs and rose uh, was the source of uh, religious uh, instruction for the children jfk never tired of quoting to me what she never tired of quoting mm -hmm. to them of those to whom much is given much, much is. is required which uh, isn't all that different from ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do well, for Well, I know country. you don't like to be called a speechwriter. And uh, I was once a long time ago. I've decided just to call you a collaborator because in, in, in reading... That had another meaning during World War II. Yes, but, it did. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, <laughs> well, a speech collaborator. How's that? A word collaborator because you, 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 you know, you, you, you say so well that so much of what was said by Kennedy or written for Kennedy, when you read the book you realize that you two were just in this together all the time and that I could understand where it would be easy to sometimes miss the line between who contributed what. You always said it was the ideas that matter, not who wrote them. 
but correct. But but do not who worded them. But you you did write speeches, and you are a wonderful writer. And uh, do do you think of yourself as a writer at all? Now that I've published my tenth book, uh... well, I don't know. You you don't seem to want to embrace it sometimes. There are many other things you want to be thought of, and you and you say almost woefully that when the New York Times writes their obituary, they're mm -hmm. gonna they're gonna call you a speechwriter, and it's like that's not the way you'd want it to be written. What would you want the first paragraph to say? You mean the uh, the caption? Well, or the first paragraph, the any caption, way you want it. The <laughs> caption, uh, the headline will say, uh, Theodore C. Sorensen, age 103. <laughs> Yay, we like that. Uh, shot by an angry husband. Uh, <laughs> uh, was Kennedy's speechwriter. <laughs> and, uh, and by the way, they will misspell it as they usually do. Yes, yes, yes. It's E-N, not uh, O-N. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, speaking of the New York Times, uh, it was just a couple of months ago that uh, that uh, marvelous Q&A uh, mm -hmm. feature yeah, they have that was uh, nice. asked me that very same question. Right. You know, what would I want to be called in that headline if it had to just be a few words? And uh, I said, servant of peace and justice. Well, that's, that is... Um that's a good one. There was, uh, in our last few minutes, I want to read something that you said that I wanted to apply to um, uh, right now, you know, right now in our political campaign. You were, you were talking about JFK's campaign for president, and you said the campaign is not really changed, campaigning has not really changed all that much, much since JFK, only more expensive and frenetic, but the core requirements address the issues that matter to people, have good ideas, good staff and strategy, and most of all, work harder than the other campaign. You say that worked in 1960. Does that still work today? Yes, where did I say that? You said that somewhere in your, somewhere, somewhere in the vast out there of all my research. Do, do you, well, do you not agree with yourself? Yes, no, that's, um, <laughs> I think that's, uh, I think that's exactly right today, and I think that's, Obama's secret. I think, he, I think Obama outworked the other candidates. He has the, and uh, you know, let's not turn this into an Obama campaign meeting, but, no, uh, but you have... the most important quality in a president was the quality JFK had, which is judgment. And Obama has shown marvelous judgment, including opposing the war before it was begun but also in picking a team. That's the single most important decision a president is going to make mm -hmm. is when he picks his team. Obama picked a campaign team that did not engage in feuds and fights like some of his opponent's teams, that did not engage in the old politics of negativity, that instead focused not on headlines, polls, endorsements, but on delegates. That's what John F. Kennedy did. Mm -hmm. He and I were out there in the 50 states working with people at the grassroots level, mayors and county chairmen and local legislators, and we'd read in the paper that Lyndon had just announced back in Washington that he now had state so-and-so because the senator from that state had just endorsed him. We knew senators didn't pick convention mm -hmm. delegates, and we were there where the convention delegates were being picked, which is the grassroots. Uh, well, on that note, uh, we're going to end and let you Do sell. I get to ask a question, Joe? What would you like to ask? Well, if you're finished, I'll, after you're finished, I will. Okay. Ask me a question. Where's the men's room? Oh. <laughs> it's, it's on our way to the book signing, so you're yeah. in luck. And then, and then when you come back uh, in a couple of years for your next book, we'll then finally get to Ich bin ein Berliner or I am a jelly donut. And if you want to know what uh, that wait, means, now you, I have to. You have to. Last week I was in my home state of Nebraska, right? Signing books, selling books, speaking, mm -hmm. and a woman who is a professor of German chided me for taking the blame in this book. For that. For that, because she said there's no blame at all. It is not grammatically incorrect. 
in uh, German, mm -hmm. and that not a single person of the two million people spread out there, and far as I could see, not she's certain not a single one of them thought JFK no. was saying, I'm a jelly donut. <laughs> but, but you're going to have to read the book to find out what that means. Thank you all very much, and thank you, Ted. Thank, thank you. you.